Ruoth and greetings uh, from Virginia in the United States to my dear brothers and sisters and fellow and students at um, Elam Theological Institute in Siaya, Kenya, where I'll be with, along with my dear friend, uh, Dr. Danny Gilbert, one month from today. We are so looking forward uh, to being with you. But of course, by the time you get this, we will have already come and gone. But Ruoth Ogwedo Ahinya Jotich Nyesai. Nyesai Obed Kodi. Nyesai Mondo Omed Ogwedo. Amen. Praise the Lord. Buona Sefiwe. Nyesai Omed Oriti Kendo Ogwedo. Hallelujah. Are you ready to study God's word today, loved ones? We are in the great study, Old Testament survey, part one, the joy of the Old Testament and its re relevance for believers today. I'm so excited to get into uh, today's study in particular. And so if you would turn with me in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 34, and we're going to focus today uh, in the beginning of this teaching on verses six and seven which are foundational and fundamental to the entire Word of God. But of course, before we open up the Word of God, let us pray. Walem. We just say, Njo roho mtakatifu. Be roho maler. We need you, Holy Spirit. And we ask you now to come and open our eyes and open our ears and open our hearts to receive all that you have for us today. Stir us at this very moment to hunger and thirst for you. And Father, we pray now that when we learn these things, that you would deepen our relationship with you. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, deepen our relationship with you. Help us to know that we know that we know the things that you're teaching us about yourself. And then, Father, we pray that as we're changed and transformed by the Holy Spirit to become more like Jesus, we would have it in our hearts to then teach and model and impart these things to your people, to disciple others, and to win the lost. We ask that you would be glorified now, Father, through our time together, and as we open up your word, help us to hear with faith and obedience in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. We are just about to get into, uh, into our study. Let me just get my my notes here where I need to be and um, we are in Exodus chapter 34 which is so fundamental and so foundational to the rest of the Bible so for that reason we're going to spend a little bit more time than I normally would spend uh, in a particular verse in a, in a survey like this because we want to cover as much ground as possible however this teaching uh, from Yahweh to Moses is so vital that it lays the groundwork uh, throughout the Bible, not just the Old Testament, but throughout the New Testament as well for us to understand who God really is. And so fundamental is this verse that it appears two other times in the Pentateuch, that is in the five books of Moses, the law, the Torah. Remember, Torah is the teaching or the instruction of Yahweh. It appears three times total in the Torah. It appears in the historical books um, through Nehemiah once. It appears many times in the Psalms. And it appears several times in the Prophets. So remember, when we think of the Old Testament, uh, the Jews referred to it as the law, 
the, the Psalms and the prophets. That was a succinct way of them referring. Jesus called it the law, the Psalms, and the prophets. So it's just the Jewish way of referring to the Old Testament. But it's important that we're going to see that what we're going to read in verses 6 and 7 uh, appears throughout the Old Testament. And it's, again, foundational to what we see in the New Testament. So let's look at what God says to uh, Moses, Yesai. He says uh, in verse 6, Then Yahweh passed by in front of him, that is, in front of Moses, and proclaimed, Yahweh, Yahweh Elohim, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in loving kindness, or chesed, and truth, who keeps chesed, loving kindness, for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. We're going to look at the definition of those Hebrew words. Uh, iniquity is avon. Uh, transgression is pesha. And sins is chata. Uh, the Jews would, would put a little uh, dot here so that we know that it, it's not pronounced chata, but chata. Hata. We're gonna we're gonna define all these three categories of sins in a moment. Why? So that we can appreciate what forgiveness and atonement is all about. So he says, abounding in chesed and truth, verse seven, who keeps loving kindness or chesed for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. Yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generation. I know that at first seems harsh and difficult, but we'll explain that uh, shortly. So, uh, Koro, I've already gone over the first part of verse 6. I've already defined uh, the Hebrew word racham, which is translated compassionate, and I've already defined the Hebrew word gracious, which is hain, and then we see now, so what is it that that we've already seen thus far? Far, The Lord repeats his name twice. He says, Yahweh, Yahweh Elohim. Remember now, I mentioned earlier the the significance of that of the repetition of that name and primarily the significance is one of intimacy it's one of um, friendship there's a there is a what's the word I'm looking for it is um, affection so when Yahweh is speaking to Moses we weren't there so we don't know the kind of tone of voice that he spoke to Moses in however in context and looking at the broader part of scripture when a name is repeated twice there is there is a conveyance of uh, of f affection of intimacy and of tenderness so my friends what we're seeing here is the father heart of God revealed to Moses and to Israel and to us as well that is out the outset now, I mentioned last time that furthermore, we see that evidenced in context. So what does he say? The very first two things that Yahweh conveys to Moses and to Israel about his nature, the very first two things also reflect the Father heart of God, compassionate, racham, a deep love from a superior to an inferior. And then gracious, a heartfelt response by someone with something to give to someone in need who also has no real claim to gracious treatment. And so when we approach God our Father or Jesus Christ our Lord or the Holy Spirit, fundamentally, 
our first thinking should be that that he relates to me from the standpoint of love and grace and mercy affection tenderness and a deep love and this graciousness where he recognizes that we stand in complete need of him that is what he wants us to understand about himself and accordingly we see in John 3 16 for God so loved the world that he gave his best his only unique son and John tells us in 1st John 4 verse 8 God is love Messai and I don't know what the Hebrew I mean what the Luo word is or the Swahili word is for love I'll have to find that out so but the foundation of of everything that we see in the New Testament is right here in Exodus 34. The joy of the Old Testament and its relevance for us today. Amen? And then he goes on and he says, Slow to anger. Slow to anger. Hold your place in Psalm 34. And if you would, turn with me to... I'm, not, I'm sorry. Hold your place in Exodus 34. And turn with, with me, if you would, to Psalm chapter 30 and verse 5. Psalm 30 and verse 5. Notice what David says about Yahweh. His anger is but for a moment, but his favor is for a lifetime. You know, in Hebrew, that word uh, for a moment is literally the wink of the eyes, the blink of, of the eyes. So here, I'm just blinking. That's how, that's how long Yahweh's anger lasts towards us. He says, his anger is but for a moment. His favor is for a lifetime. Well, what is David doing there? He's reflecting back on Psalm 34. In my own quiet time this morning, I was reading uh, Psalm 23, 24, and 25, and um, I'm in Genesis, so I finished Genesis 23 today, and then I'm in uh, Matthew 5. I haven't gotten to Matthew 5 yet, but in I recognized in, um, in Psalm 25 and verse 6, I immediately recognized that David was referring to back to Exodus 34 when he writes these words he says remember O Yahweh remember is not just don't forget remember is a covenant word so when we see the word remember when it comes to uh, taking communion it's not just don't forget or when we see remember in Deuteronomy or throughout the Bible that word remember is um, is the the biblical writers appeal to God don't forsake your covenant. So remember is a covenant word. Stay true to your covenant. Of course, God is going to stay true to his covenant. But when we look at that word remember, uh, it is a covenant word. It is an appeal to God to keep his word. A reminder to God, if you will, uh, to keep his word. Of, of course, God doesn't need to be reminded. Reminded, But it's, it's just in a... It's a tender-hearted, humble appeal. So back to Exodus 34, God himself wants us to know how he relates to us. And he is saying to this, in my relationship with you, I am slow to anger. Remember, the, the wink of the eye, the blink of the eye, and abounding, abounding in hesed, and truth. We defined chesed. I don't have any room here uh, to write on the whiteboard, but we define chesed as it can it can be translated in five different ways: covenant loyalty, faithfulness, steadfast love, devotion, mercy, and faithfulness. I think I already mentioned that uh, thus far. Now. And he says, abounding in chesed and truth. Well, what does Jesus say about himself? I am the way, the truth, 
and the life. The life. God is referred to as the life in the Old Testament um, over and over and over. Chaim, the life. Uh, Chaim is a, is a popular word uh, in Hebrew to refer to uh, who the nature of God. So he says, who keeps loving kindness or chesed, there's a repetition there for the second time, for thousands, and then who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. Now, the word uh, forgives is where we get our word atonement from. Atonement means to cover, to cover our sins. But the covering doesn't mean that the, 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 the covering, the atonement requires something, doesn't it? The, the atonement requires a death to take place. The atonement requires blood to be shed. The atonement requires a substitution on our behalf. So Yahweh in his justice doesn't just say, oh, okay, I'll, I'll just forgive you without a payment, without a sacrifice, without a death being affected because he is just and he is righteous and he is holy and he, and he, and the, uh, I, his justice requires a payment to be made. Thus, we see the sacrificial system in the Old Testament, which we're going to focus on a little bit later as we get further into Exodus and a lot more when we get into Leviticus. And that sacrificial system, as you already know, simply points the way to the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world because the sacrifices had to be repeated over and over and over throughout the year. They couldn't ultimately take away sins. They had to be repeated. So they were temporary, pointing to something permanent, and that is the sinless blood of Yeshua, of Jesus, who would cleanse our sin forevermore. And uh, there are so many more implications to that, which we can't get into right now. But it's vital for us to understand the very heart, the nature of sin, so that we recognize when God forgives us, when he covers our sin, when blood is shed for us, for our sins, the sins are a very, very serious thing. So forgives means to atone for and wipe out. Um, one of the, I think I already mentioned this, but... In my mind, perhaps the, the most dramatic description of forgiveness in the Bible comes in Isaiah 43 and verse 25, which says this, I, this is God speaking, I, even I, have wiped out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Not. The Hebrew word lo means under any circumstances ever, ever, ever. I will not remember your sins. Again, this isn't just I'll forget your sins, but in accordance to my covenant, I have removed your transgressions as far as the east is from the west. Why does God use that phrase? Because you can't North, south, you can you can uh, measure that, but east and west, you cannot measure. There's a reason why he uses that. By the way, that word east uh, from the west is found in um, uh, let's see, Psalm uh, Psalm 103, verse 12. Psalm 103, verse 12. Uh, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. So he forgives what? He forgives a threefold category of sin, iniquity, transgression, and sin. Now let's look at those, the meaning of those words. First and foremost, um, he says, uh, iniquity, transgression, and sin. Iniquity, the Hebrew word is pronounced avon, avon. 
there's a little uh, signal there. And iniquity is, it means to be crooked. There are certain aspects of our sin that God would say you're crooked or twisted. Sin twists truth, doesn't it? We see that in our culture a lot. People twist the truth to get what they want or to justify their sin. It is a perversion. There, there are certain aspects of iniquity that are perverse. There's a perversion to sin. It, it completely goes against the nature of God and, and us being created in His image and after His likeness. There's a distortion of what is true and what is right. That's, that's under the category of iniquity. And it simply can mean to act or to do wickedly. And so when Yahweh uh, forgives our iniquity, He wipes it away. Isn't this powerful? He wipes it away as if it never happened. Oh, I love this. Don't you love this? He erases it. I... Even I have wiped out your transgressions for my own sake, <coughs> and I will not remember your sins. As far as the east is from the west, if First John 1 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive, atone our sins, and purify us from all unrighteousness. So when we confess our sins, then the Holy Spirit begins to work to cleanse us from all of that corruption. Do you see how that happens, loved ones? And where does it all come from? Let's see if I can find my um, my uh, markers. I have a red one. It all comes from the, hallelujah, the blood, hallelujah, of Jesus, Yesu, Opaki Yesu. It's the blood of Jesus that, that cleanses us from all our sin. When the blood of Jesus is shed on the cross and we place our faith in Him for forgiveness, then we are declared righteous in His sight. Now, does that, does that mean we don't have to continually ask Him to forgive us when we sin? Of course not. That's right there in the Lord's Prayer where He says, Our Father, hallowed be Your name, and that's just one section of the prayer where we can spend a lot of time just focusing on the Father for who He is and thanking Him and praising Him. And then your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And that's where we we can intercede for ourselves and our loved ones and the church and so many other things that the Lord puts on our heart. Then He says, give us this day, this day, tells us in the Lord's pattern of prayer this day that this is a what? A daily pattern of prayer. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our so when we pray give us this day our daily bread this is an opportunity for us to unload the burdens that we have, the cares, the concerns, the worries that we have, and take those cares and concerns to God our Father. Well, then in the next section after that, as the Holy Spirit leads us, what do we do? We say, forgive us our debts. So because this is a daily pattern of prayer, notice the wisdom of Jesus in taking care of our need to have a right relationship with God our Father. What happens 
when we sin and we don't confess it, we grieve the Holy Spirit and fellowship is broken. All we have to do is confess our sins and allow the Holy Spirit to search our hearts on a daily basis. And of course, not just on a daily basis, sometimes it's an hourly basis to, to rid that junk from us. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. So there's a twofold aspect to forgiveness. I want God my Father to forgive me of my sins. But if I'm not willing then to forgive you of your sins, then that breaks and blocks my relationship with God my Father. And so again, the brilliance of Jesus' teaching. And then, of course, he leads us into the last part. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. There is provision on a daily basis for us to engage in spiritual warfare. Now, I've just taught on the greatest pattern of prayer anywhere ever, and I did it in a very short bit. I've already taught on that uh, several trips ago, but as the Lord leads, I'll teach on it uh, again. Now, let's return uh, to this, this teaching from Exodus 34, 7, about the threefold category, uh, the threefold nature of sin. There's a threefold nature to it. So he says that he forgives us or atones or covers our transgressions. Pesha is plural. So it's not just transgression singular, it's plural. What is transgression? Transgression is, is a breaking away from authority. It is to break away intentionally from the authority of God our Father. And what is his authority for? His authority is for our good, for our protection. His authority is rooted in love, restoration, redemption. So as, as leaders in the body of Christ, the authority that God gives us should always be carried out with humility and truth, with love and compassion, with redemption, and with a heart of restoration. So he says that uh, transgressions is to break away from authority. It is a revolt. There are sins that we commit where we're just revolting against God. We know it's wrong and we do it anyway. It means to rebel. Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and it means to offend. So my friends, when we transgress, we are offending God. We're rebelling against Him. We're revolting against Him. But when He forgives us, as soon as we ask, what does He do? I, even I, have wiped out your transgressions for my own sake and I will not I will not remember your sins isn't that amazing and it's all as a result of the crucifixion of Jesus and then sins I barely could get it in here sins is more of a, a general word and it, it simply means to miss the mark. To miss the mark. I, I put in a, a New Testament verse here, but of course Paul was Jewish and he was thinking as a Jewish man would um, from an old, old Testament standpoint. What does he say in Romans 3.23? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We've missed the mark. When we sin, we miss the mark that is the standard that God has for us. Now, let's continue on and um, <clears throat> finish up verse 7, as long as my voice lasts. He says, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin, 
yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. What he means there, loved ones, in context of Exodus and beyond, he is simply referring to people who refuse to repent. Context, the very, the very same verse who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin, people know that God forgives them, but, but people also refuse to repent. Why? Because they love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. That's what Jesus says in John chapter 3, uh, verses 18 through 20. So God, as a just, holy, righteous God, if people refuse to repent of their sin, then he is required to judge them. Otherwise, he would not be just, righteous, and holy. So he says, he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generation. These generational uh, sins have influence on us. Now, it's not... Again, context. It's not that God is punishing the children for the father's sins. Because we find in Deuteronomy um, 24, verse 16, if you'll turn with me there, Deuteronomy 24 uh, and verse 16, hold your place in Leviticus, Deuteronomy 24 and verse 16, Fathers shall not be put to death for their sons, nor shall sons be put to death for their fathers, everyone shall be put to death for his own sin. All this simply means is that sin has effects on subsequent generations. Now, you understand this probably better than, than I do. In our culture in the United States, we have foolishly become uh, hyper-individualistic. And, and therefore, decept, we've deceived ourselves. And so we often, not we, I wouldn't say this, but sinners often say, listen, what I do behind the walls of my own home doesn't affect you. But that is a lie from the pit of hell. Because sin is poison, and poison affects everything. Well, our, our generation and our culture looks at life from an individual standpoint. Your culture in Kenya does not. You understand uh, you understand society. That's more of the biblical worldview. The biblical worldview understands that what that we're all in this together and that when when one does what is good it influences others for good, and what one does for evil influences others for evil. People that sin intentionally are never satisfied uh, just to, to sin and get away with it for themselves. They want to influence others. Peter addresses that. In, I think it's Second Peter, where he says, they're surprised that you don't run with them and do the things that you used to do, and they try to drag you back into it. So when, when we do things for righteousness, we want to influence others. That's one of the reasons why we preach the gospel. We have been changed ourselves, so we want to bring others to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. But when we sin, we also want to feel good about our sins, so we try to get others to agree with us and join us in that sin. You see, we are a corporate people. We're not just individuals were tied together in community. And so Yahweh is warning that current generation that when you sin, there are going to be consequences to your sons and daughters and, and to their sons and daughters. Let's just take divorce, for example, in my culture especially. When Parents don't get along and they divorce. What happens to the children? 
it, it breaks their hearts. It imparts insecurity. It often imparts rebellion or depression. And it just breaks apart the soundness of the family that God wants to give a family. So the sins of the fathers and the mothers then are visited upon the children. It's not that God is punishing the children. It's that God is saying to the fathers, if you sin and, and get away with it, you're not really getting away with it. That sin is going to reach down and poison your children and then their children and then their children and then their children. Let me give you another example. <clears throat> My father, as many of you know, was an alcoholic. <clears throat> However, by the grace of God, I didn't become an alcoholic. And my middle brother did not become an alcoholic. And my youngest brother, to the best of my knowledge, has never become an alcoholic. And... And I was the first person on either side of my family that I know of for generations to become a Christian. I don't know of any other family members on my father's side or on my mother's side that became a Christian. And certainly no one, probably for many generations, if ever, became a preacher. My middle brother one day told me, or my youngest brother one day told me years ago, he said, you know, Brad, it's like God drew a line in the sand with us three boys and said no more. So, um, so God delivered us from so many things. I have often wondered if, if I am that fourth generation, so to speak. Now, that doesn't mean that, that my father's alcoholism didn't have effects on me. Um, surely they did in various ways. And that's, that's where the Holy Spirit comes in and sanctifies me, helps me to become more like Jesus. One commentator uh, writing about Exodus 34 said this. He said, the effects of disobedience last for some time, but the effects of loving God are far more extensive to a thousand generations. Did you see that? Watch this again in verse 7. Who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin, yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpublished, unpunished, visiting the iniquity of fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. Now, a generation is, generally speaking, about 40 years. So 40, 80, 120, maybe 160. But the idea of thousands is probably generational. And, and in, in addition, in uh, numbers as well, numerically. So, my friends, the, this passage, these two verses, you can find them in Numbers chapter 14 and verse 18. You can find these verses in Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 31. You can find it in Nehemiah. That's, that's one of the historical books. In Nehemiah 9.17. It's repeated in Psalm 86, verse 15. Psalm 103, verse 8. Psalm 108, verse 11. Psalm 145, verse 8. Joel, there's the prophets. Chapter 2, verse 13. Nahum, Nahum, which is compassion, is chapter 1, verse 3. And Jonah chapter 4, verse 2. So three appearances <clears throat> in the prophets. So again, let me just reiterate in concluding that you can see 
just by virtue of how often this has been repeated, how important it is throughout the Old Testament. And as we read the New Testament, I'm thinking of the prodigal of the parable son, for example. Uh, the, the, the parable of the prodigal son. Sorry, I, I I'm getting tired, so I need to take a break. In the parable of the prodigal son in Luke 15, you see the father of, of the two rebellious sons full of compassion and he's gracious, he's compassionate and gracious. He's kind, he's tender. He forgives, he's slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. And you see that by the way that he responds to the prodigal son and the way that he appeals to the arrogant, ungrateful uh, son that never left him, the self-righteous son. Where does that come from? It comes from Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7. Anywhere that you read in the New Testament about the love of God the Father and the love of God the Son and the love of the Holy Spirit, it's rooted right there in Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7. So I commend Exodus 34, 6 and 7 to you to meditate on, to memorize, to pray through and to teach the people, teach the people that God has entrusted to you about the nature of God, the specific nature of God, who he is and how he relates to us. This is a core teaching of the Old Testament and it's why I've chosen to spend about 40 minutes on this subject because it's so important. Let's close by praying through these two verses. Remember the importance of praying Scripture, of meditating on Scripture, of getting it down into our hearts on a deeper level. So let's pray. Would you join me, Walem? Father, thank you. Jesus, thank you. Holy Spirit, thank you that you are Yahweh, Yahweh. Yahweh Elohim, thank you that you speak tenderly to us and, and, and affectionately to us. Thank you that you reveal yourself to us that way by repeating your name. Thank you, Father, that you are compassionate towards us. You have a deep love uh, towards us, and you are gracious. You have a heartfelt response toward us when we call upon you. Thank you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that you are slow to anger towards us, and you are abounding in chesed and truth toward us. We can count on your steadfast love. We can count on your covenant loyalty with us. We can count on your faithfulness towards us. We can count on your devotion towards us. And we can count on your um, mercy toward us. And we love your truth. You are the God of truth. And it's your truth that sets us free. And we thank you that you keep chesed for us. You forgive every time we ask you. Every time you forgive and wipe away our iniquity and our transgressions and our sins. Truly you are good. We thank you that you are true and just and righteous and holy. And you do punish sin for those who refuse to repent. Father, thank you that you have revealed yourself to us this way through your inspired, inerrant, and infallible word. Now, Father, help us through the working of the Holy Spirit. Cleanse our thinking insofar as we, we don't have a, a right, accurate assessment of you. And birth within us, Holy Spirit, a deeper understanding of this true, freeing, liberating nature of God. 
We ask all of this because we know it's your will. And we ask it confidently in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Let's just stop now and, and give God thanks and praise. Would you stand and let's just give him thanks and praise. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. We give you thanks and praise that you love us enough to give us your truth and set us free through the working of the Holy Spirit. Buona Asafiwe, Opak Rok, Opak Yesu, Nisai Ber, Nisai Duong. Hallelujah. We give you thanks and praise, both now and forevermore. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his shalom, both now and forevermore, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. This is Pastor Brad Abley teaching you students uh, Elam Theological Institute. Until next time, God bless you.